Welcome back to Painting Trafalgar. We're not to episode 15 yet. I'm not sure what episode we're on because I haven't been very careful about you know, documenting the whole process of... Basically, I make the videos and I upload them. And then I think, I'll come back and tag those later. You know what meta tagging is? Most of you do, right? Like, let's see, put a little hashtag. And then the hashtags would be, you know, Battle of Trafalgar. Or sailing ship. Or painting instructions. All the topics that this series of videos is trying to hit. Um, but what usually happens is I upload them and then I go about my day. <laughs> I enjoy listening to them myself. I put my headphones on and then I'll go do the dishes and I'll listen to what I have to say. And usually I'm okay with everything. You know, I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, there was ones that I that I were not happy with and I just deleted them and redid them. But most of them I did okay. But then I will notice like some mistakes I made. Like earlier, uh, I referred to the plastic lion as a tiger. <laughs> and then I realized, oh yeah, that's not a... It's not a tiger. A tiger can't change the stripes. Uh, I'm in the middle now. Is it in the middle? I'm not sure if it's the middle. I am I'm trying to zoom out here. It's 30 inches wide, this painting. This is the one you saw the photograph of that I was uh, using you know, off my computer screen and um, trying to translate that onto the canvas. And the issues that I'm struggling with are uh, tone issues. And uh, for instance, let's look at the sky in the background and compare its tone. It's very light compared to the surface of the water, which is very dark. The lightest thing in the painting is the sails of the schooner, which is catching the light. And that reflects, <laughs> get it, reflects on the photograph. So look at the sky compared to the water. The light blue paper or light blue fabric that I had is a stand-in for the sea. It's much lighter blue than the blue that I'm putting in here. But as I'm painting it, this blue feels bright. And then the sky was just a roll of paper that was taped up against the cabinets of my kitchen, beneath, you know, under my sink, um, and it wasn't lit very well. The schooner is lit by a bright light which I have off screen to the right because I wanted the schooner to be a different tone than the three-masted tall ship in the background, the HMS Victory in the background. So in order to get the sails on the three-master darker and have the light hitting the schooner, you have to believe that the, the sunlight is not falling evenly. And in here I have a sky where the sunlight would be falling evenly, and there is sunlight. I have uh, a lighter area here, and it, there's going to be a little lighter area here, as if the sunlight filtering down and just touching these parts. This part here would be in the shadow of the top, which is the black painted platform, platform right there. Um, so there's there's issues about what of this in the foreground is illuminated and by what. If you look at the photograph, <clears throat> there was a light that was hitting this sail. And I like that it made this light, lighter pattern here. None of the things on the deck were lit. And I like that, as I said earlier in a previous uh, episode, I like the idea that you have this uh, silhouetted foreground and then the lit background and middle ground, which is not how you usually perceive things. Usually the stuff that's closer to you, you're seeing brighter. Is that true? Like if you're in the cafe and you're looking outside, obviously the door outside is much brighter, but your eye adjusts to the interior lighting. In this case, you're out in the open air and presumably this uh, the vessel in the foreground would be just as bathed in light, unless it was in shadow, and unless, meaning on a bright sunny day on the ocean, there was a cloud and the cloud was casting a shadow. So this is a long way around of saying, my sky should be darker to account for the counterintuitive dark shapes here. If the sun is falling this way, it should also be hitting the deck. So at this early stage in the painting, um, maybe the solution is to add light to the deck in the foreground. But that would be a further departure from the original subject matter, which I liked. 
Like I was giving that the thumbs up and I decided to paint it. Now that I'm actually in the painting, I'm starting to second guess some of the decisions. Um, I think what I should do is lighten the sea, darken the sky so that these tones match, but they still have to be lighter than all the stuff in the foreground. I think you can follow that, right? Like if I was going to reduce this image to just three tones or four, one would be the bright uh, schooner. The other two would be the sea and the sky, and the third one would be all of the, of the ship's features in the foreground. If you squint your eyes, you could probably just have it break down into blue, brownish gray, and the sky color. Um, that was a whole concept. I'll confess, I started this video not knowing what I was going to talk about, but I knew I'd find something to talk about. Because uh, my head has been in this painting, and I'll talk about the issues that I've been grappling with. One of the troublesome things is to lay down the painting, the drawing of the painting, right? Like, I laid out the location of the shrouds, but then I painted stuff in, and then I painted over where some of the shrouds are painted. And I'll have to actually go back in and pick these back out again, these locations, these landmarks, so that when I do paint the shrouds back in, um, I won't have to remeasure the location of each point where they fall along the rail. A lot of painting is painting over something, and then what you painted over is now lost. And you want to not paint over something that doesn't need to be painted over because you don't want to duplicate the effort. You could make a painting last 10 years. I'm sure there's been artists who've worked for 10 years on a painting. And there's a point in all of that process where there was, a, you know, time that could have been better managed. But part of the process of painting is the process of discovering. Like if I mix up some bluish greenish paint and I apply it to the canvas, when I'm working on it down here on the pilot, I'm not really sure how it's going to behave when I get it up here. So you do have to do these daubs of paint and then look at them and see how they affect everything else. And that involves the time it takes to mix the paint and apply it. And then subsequently you're going to put layers on top of it, covering it completely. So what did you gain from that process of putting the paint on in the first place if it's only going to get covered up? You gained the experience, right? You understood what you were doing, and it taught you something that you can't express in words about the canvas itself and the paint that you're putting on it, this particular painting in this particular area. When you paint over it later, the physical reminder is gone, but the memory and the lesson in your head is still there. So not everything that gets covered up was a waste. You know, that's why they do rehearsals in the theater. They don't just do the play cold, they rehearse it and get it right. So a lot of what I do here is going to be rehearsals for the final surface of the painting will be finally visible at the end. And a good example of that has been the color of the deck. In the Royal Navy, um, much is made about holy stoning. There's a, uh, a practice where you throw water and sand onto the deck, and then the crew gets these uh, blocks of stone, granite slabs, that are the size of a big Bible and they, they called them holy stones, and then they would uh, grind down the surface of the deck. And holy stoning a deck was a, like a, almost a daily event sometimes. I'm not sure exactly. I don't know if anybody's really sure. It was done, though. Um, but what I'm getting at is what color do you get then with the deck? And the answer, as it so often is, is, you know, it depends. Um, if the deck gets wet, it gets darker. If it dries out, it's going to be lighter. You know, the conditions at, the, at sea here, you could imagine there's been spray shooting over the bow and it's getting this part wet, so it's going to look different. I have this, like, slight bluish sheen here, um, like reflected light on the floor, you know, on a polished floor. And I like that. I like having the bluish sheen because it adds color down here, but it also adds um, to the atmosphere. The eye is told, like, oh, this surface is glossy and it shines like that and then if I had a figure of a person standing right here there'd be a little bit of a reflection of the person made up of the color of the darkened deck and you can kind of see that underneath the cannons these are cannons 
Um, but reconstructing the, the deck of the 74 has been very difficult. I have the actual model right here, so I can go over and glance at it. Um, but I still have a lot of questions just about 74s in general. There are no 74s anymore. There's schooners that are, or I'm sorry, there are schooners. The HMS Victory still exists. You can go visit her in Portsmouth. I have. I, I was there once. Um, but she doesn't really represent what a working ship would look like anymore. And so she has a deck. I'm not certain that the deck looks the way it would at sea under, you know, Royal Navy usage in the 1800s. It has, like, too nice a look to it, like it's being very carefully monitored. And um, getting back to the 74, um, you can find sailing ships today that have wooden decks, but I don't think anybody's holy stoning their decks. I don't, I've never heard of anybody actually doing that to go to that level where you're recreating the life of the sailors that way and you're doing those kind of tasks. The idea of the holy stoning was that if the deck got dirty, you were scraping off any dirt that way. And you were also, it was part of the daily routine. So if you have 600 people in the crew, you don't want them sitting around without something to do. So there's some of these these traditional sailor jobs. Some of them were uh, to keep the idle hands busy. You know, you're, you're supposed to never have your hands in your pockets if you're crew on a ship and you're on duty because that's broadcasting to the world that you aren't busy right now and they wanted to keep them busy all the time. There was a real threat of mutiny. I don't want to go into all that part of the story of the Royal Navy, but they did have you know mutinies. The problem is you've got like a, a tiny percentage of people in charge of a huge majority of, of underling crew. How do you keep them all obedient all the time? And I guess the answer is they would whip them with uh, you know discipline. They literally whip them and occasionally they would hang them. I've been working on the sails, trying to have the, the clued up core sails. That's what these are. On the models that I built, I made them out of tissue paper and wrinkled them up and glued them into position. And um, I talked about this before. I told you about building this model, a much larger one, just to get the wrinkles right. But I still haven't quite got the wrinkles right. They're too big, you know. Even at this large scale, the largest I can manage inside my apartment, they're just not convincing. So I'm painting that, but I'm going to have to put wrinkles on top of the wrinkles. And I've spent more time now painting just this area and painting over it in that same sense of like covering up the day before his work, but still coming out ahead because now you know more. It looks better today than it did the last couple of days when I worked on it. But I think that this will be the part that the eye will look at and look critically at, because everybody knows what a wrinkle looks like. I'm a little nervous about how that's all going to turn out. I guess you can tell that uh, this is kind of a rambling nature commentary today. I'm trying to think, like, what questions would you have? What I haven't shown here is um, stuff that, that, that got painted out. Like, I had the mainstay, which is this big heavy rope here. And it would, there's a, it appears here and then disappears again. It should go all the way up here, and it will. But there's a point where, like, painting on top of the sea or painting the sea on top of the thing, one of the two things becomes the dominant activity. And that's why these shrouds disappeared here. They were all painted from the, from the masthead to the deck, but they reached a point where they were being painted over. Uh, yeah, you'll have to tune in next time to see how this goes. Um, I think you ro could roll the tape back and you could hear me say this is the middle of the painting, but I believe I'm just trying to convince myself I'm in the middle. I'm still at the beginning. I still haven't laid out where the crew is going to be, but I'm certainly going to have like people doing things. Um, there's an opportunity to fill in the blanks in my, my collective understanding. My collective understanding? No. These are hammocks. They, the crew sleeps on hammocks. At the end of their watch, they roll up the hammocks into these tubes and they bring them on deck and there's a steel rack here, an iron rack, that the hammocks drop into. And then they're often depicted covered with a canvas cover that is painted sometimes the color of the bulwark, so it's like a black color. Or it's just left canvas. And then I've seen examples where they're just showing it um, where you see a bunch of little cylinders. And that's how I've always depicted it on my models, like they're not covered with a canvas. 
they're supposed to be individual um, hammocks. But I thought, well, here's an opportunity. I can have my cake and eat it, too. I can have the crew depicted rolling the canvas cover over them. So I could show the hammocks as tubes, but I could also show them being all, you know, their appearance being altered because now the canvas is going to cover them. In the same way, I'm sure they would have had canvas covers on the boats, too. Um, they had a full-time sailmaking crew on board, so they could have canvas covers for everything they wanted. I guess I'll sign off. That's 15 minutes, and it's been mostly rambling. I'm going to listen to this one and then decide if I even want to upload it, because it is formless and amorphous, and it doesn't really start at the beginning, move through the middle, and then end at an obvious point. But thanks for visiting again, and um, hope you're enjoying the spring weather. There's now some blossoms on the trees outside the window. When I started doing this, it was the dead of winter.